let's talk. This is going to be uh, Communicating Risk by Jenny Bramble and Dante. Hi, I'm Jenny. Currently, I am a software test creature over at a company called Willow Tree. We make digital, uh, digital innovation agency. We make mobile apps for clients. It is way more fun than I thought it would ever be. That's not our office, but I'm trying to argue for a ball pit. <laughs> so uh, my history, I was originally a support monkey. I did support, loved it. Accidentally got into DevOps, hated it. Went running and screaming back to support, then kind of did this weird support QA kind of role, and they finally dragged me kicking and screaming into software testing. How many software testers do I have in the room? Oh, yeah. Represent. Fantastic. So that's where I'm coming from. Uh, I am a QA creature. Uh, that's how I define myself in my professional life and in my personal life. Um, I think of myself as a tester and a questioner and a seeker of things. Well, enough about me, let's talk about risk. Oh, right, this is Dante. He trapped himself in the bathroom for 12 hours once. Yeah, that was a fun maintenance request to the apartment. So what are we gonna do today? We are going to talk about a bunch of stuff. First off, we're gonna talk about my job. We're gonna talk about how words are awful. <laughs> then we're gonna define risk, and we're gonna talk about using that definition. Um, I might skip some slides. I will totally provide them afterwards, and you can be like, oh, okay. Or not. I can't test everything. Please don't ask me to test everything. I was in grooming the other day, and my principal engineer goes, we're going to test everything. And I'm like, no, maybe you want to test everything, but I'm not going to test everything. I can't. <sighs> my gosh. Not my job. I know you like nice things like the banana bed. I went on Amazon and bought him a banana bed. <laughs> what is my job? Okay, I ask questions. I absorb the answers. I translate those answers from what I understand to what other people understand. I talk to my developers. I talk to my software principals. I talk to product owners. I talk to clients. I talk to random people on the street. I talk to my mom. I verify that systems under test perform in all the ways that the stakeholders expect or help reset those expectations. And I find that's becoming a larger and larger part of my job as I'm becoming more senior. It's saying, your expectations are a thing that you have. You might need to think about them. <laughs> I educate other humans about testing. And I'm not sure I'll be able to, I'll have time to get to that in this talk. But if you ever want to talk to me about what testing is, I'm your girl. Also, there's some other testers in the room. They're also your humans. I advocate for quality practices, methodologies, and thought patterns. Again, as I become more senior in my role, I find my job becoming a little more abstract. I don't do quality. I promote quality. I advocate quality. I diffuse bombs. Usually those are humans. And I evaluate and communicate risk to the people around me. Dante thinks my job also entails petting Dante. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of cat pictures in here. If you don't like cats, I don't have anything for you. <laughs> okay, everyone knows what risk is, right? We all know what risk is. I like my coffee sweet. My sister likes her coffee sweet. If she gave me sweet coffee, I would die. She likes a teaspoon of sugar in hers, and I like a half a cup. Sweet means two different things to two people that are genetically similar. When I say risk, it means one thing to me. It means something entirely different to my product owner, something entirely different to my developers, something entirely different to my mom. These words are terrible. Words are the absolute worst way that we can possibly communicate. There's so much variability in them. There's so much that makes them gooey and weird and squishy. These terms have a lot of connotations to us personally and to all the people around us. And I can't really predict how you feel about certain words. But 
we can define terms. Once we start defining terms, we start being able to communicate across cross-functional teams. We start using the same words, but most importantly, we're using the same meanings for those words. If we're using different meanings, they might as well be absolutely different words. It gives us the ability to justify our decisions to people outside of our sphere. And when I say sphere, for me, that means my, my group of testers. I can now talk to my product owners. I can talk to developers. I can talk to random people. I can talk to my mom. I really need to call my mom today. And I can give updates that have depth and that have meaning. And when I say depth, I mean I'm not saying I tested. I'm saying I tested this thing and I found it was risky. I found this. I found that. And these terms start to have meaning. My status updates start to have more meaning. I used to find myself a lot of times I'd be in Scrum and I'd be like, I'm testing today. And they'd be like, good job. <laughs> Test. I'm like, yeah, I'm testing. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I could be walking out and getting milkshakes for everybody and for all they know. When I start defining terms, when I start saying, hey, this is what I mean when I say I'm testing, this is what I mean when I start freaking out about things that are risky, it starts to have a little bit more color and make a little bit more sense. And we can also start determining what resources we need to apply to a project. That's going to become a little bit more clear later. That's sort of a weird place to put that bullet point. Note to self. Once we start to find... <laughs> Oh, someone told me I didn't take myself seriously enough, and I'm like, I can't take it. I'm sorry. <laughs> we can communicate more clearly, precisely, because we all know what we're talking about. My sister and I had a long discussion about coffee for about a week, and now she can make me a sweet coffee. I can make her a sweet coffee. And that's, that's really improved our relationship a lot, got to be honest. Dante communicates exclusively with biting and crying. Lots of crying. <laughs> what is risk? Okay, we're back to this topic again. I love this topic. Risk is anything that can go wrong. It's something awful. It's so scary. It's a headline bug. It's running out of cat food. It's everybody panic production is down. We're all going to get fired. We're going to have to work at McDonald's. We're going to... Oh. It could be anything. It could be so much stuff. And I'm super emotional. I communicate almost exclusively through panic attacks and waving my arms like one of those things you see outside of a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're laughing because you're like, I know that person. <laughs> and for a long time, I had a lot of trouble communicating with logical people. A lot of the humans I work with think logically, they think progressively, they think in steps. They say, this is a thing, this is the reason that thing happened, let's fix that thing. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> and I would say things, oh gosh, oh poor baby Jenny. I would say things like, I feel bad about this. This feature makes me sad. I'm upset. And the developers are like, you are really squishy and weird and I don't know how to deal with you. So I had to bring them into my sphere. I had to start teaching them about my emotions because that's the only way we could communicate. I mean, I was having trouble communicating logically and they could assign meanings to the things I would say like, I feel bad. Once I started being able to think about defining terms and defining my gut instincts into actual phrases and words that were not just <laughs> <laughs> my life got a lot easier. Everyone around me, their lives got a lot easier and a little bit quieter, I'll be honest. What is risk? Risk is the impact of failure and the probability that that failure will occur. So simple, give or take. And a way that I could now say to my product owner, I think this is risky. I think this is dangerous. I am worried. This is why. These two things make up this term that was nebulous before, and now we've hardened it a bit. Dante would like to give a plug. Don't worry. I didn't give him any wine. That's fine. Let's talk impact of failure. Any potential negative impact contributes to the risk of the application feature or use case. 
there are so many different kinds of impact. A lot of times we think impact is production goes down. There's a hot fix. There's an issue. We can have a lot of different kinds of impact. We can have technical, loss of data, introduction of security flaws, business. What if revenue can't be collected? What if critical functions can't be performed? What if the CEO's name is misspelled? True story. We can have morale issues come up. If a user has to utilize a workaround because of something we've introduced, that's an impact. My previous position, most of our users actually worked across the street from us, and uh, we had a couple of pitchfork incidents. Fire no longer allowed in the office. You can also see slowed down workflows. Any of these impacts that people don't understand why they're happening is going to be an issue, and that's going to be a morale thing. We would have some success when we explained to them that this workaround was going to start having to be utilized, but still, it's an impact because they don't really understand why you are doing this to them. And that's, that's kind of a bummer. When we start thinking about impact of failure, we want to start determining what features do users look at the most? What do they touch most often? What happens if that fails? Are they going to not be able to interact with the system? Are they going to lose data? Are we going to lose money? Will someone literally die in case of like a medical thing? It's, it's a potentiality. potentiality. In short, what is impactful to the company? What makes an impact on the company, on the users, on the team, on anyone? That is the impact. Dante gets it. Impact of leaving him for the weekend is everything falls off the table. Also, last time he dug a hole in one of my plants and got dirt all over the place. <laughs> Clearly, I need a Dante sitter. Let's talk probability of failure. The likelihood that the application use case feature will fail. Seems pretty simple, right? It'll fail or it won't. Mm, no. So when we start talking about probability of failure, we're making educated guesses. We don't know how likely it is to fail. We guess. But we have data that can help us tell if we're guessing in the right direction. Um, has it failed before? Has something similar failed? Do Excuse me. Do we have historical data in the form of defects or tribal knowledge, RCAs, QCAs, anything like that? That weird guy in the corner that's been there forever and knows literally everything. Talk to that guy. That's a great guy to know. These things are going to help us determine, can, this, can, can we guess if this is going to fail? Again, we want to also ask, how often do users interact with this? Is this something they are hitting every single day, all the time? then maybe we need to think a little bit more about the likelihood that it's going to fail. If we, start, if we start with this and if we miscalculate it, then we start to put ourselves in kind of a weird position down the line. We would be like, oh, I didn't think it was going to fail. Oops. And that can be super uncomfortable. One of the things I like to do there is talk to as many people as possible. If you can see YA, then you're in a way better position if you guess incorrectly. And remember your failures. Remember if you've guessed incorrectly, because that'll help you not guess incorrectly the next time something similar comes up. Again, what, user, what features do users interact with the most? How do they interact with them? What's inherently fragile? Are there external changes to consider? How do you feel? Are you proud of your features? Those are two questions that I like to ask developers and I like to ask product owners, and I like to ask technical requirements managers if I've got them on the team. Um, I find that there's not a lot of situations where we ask if we're proud of something unless it's failing. Are you proud of what you've done, Matt? It can be really valuable. <laughs> it's okay, you can laugh, it's cool. <laughs> it can be really valuable to ask somebody if they're proud of a feature. You would not believe the number of times I've gone to developers and said, are you proud of this? Are you happy to be releasing it? And they're like, oh. and you step back and you think, hmm, 
let's run a few extra test cases on that bad boy. <laughs> when someone is proud of something, when they're happy about it, when their morale is high, the quality of that project is generally going to be higher. People ask all the time in quality assurance, what is a metric we could use to evaluate your performance? And someone in the back goes, how many bugs? And then the rest of the QA people start beating them up because that is the worst metric to ever use for anything quality assurance. Number of bugs is essentially pitting two groups of people against each other against their will. And that's not okay. That's super not okay. When I was a baby QA monkey, I used to uh, think I was playfully antagonistic with my developers. It was me versus them, and I always won. And as I've gotten older, I'm like, oh, that's more embarrassing. <laughs> because it's not me versus them, it's an us thing. And that's why my favorite quality assurance metric is morale. If your team is happy, if you are generally pleasant with each other, if you generally like each other, if you generally feel good about your product, it probably has a pretty high amount of quality into it. You can say, yeah, I'm proud of this. It's probably pretty awesome, unless you're working with terrible people, at which point we're hiring. These are very educated guesses about what might fail. You may get it wrong, you're probably not going to, because you're good at your job, you know what you're doing, you've done this before, and you've got people you can ask about it. Unlike Dante, who is very, very busy, he fell off the roof. <laughs> Doctors outside your feature, use case, or application can also uh, contribute to risk, and they're also something that need to be talked about. I say impact of failure and probability of failure, and also other types of risk. So there's a lot of things here. This is not everything because Everything is a huge number. These are things I've run into in the past six months. Modified timetable. More time or less time. A lot of times you're like, oh, more time. Yeah, we can do stuff. It's going to be great. No, your developer is in the back and they are refactoring something. <laughs> when you give people extra time, they're like, okay, we can do more. And if they're doing more, that's potentially going to increase risk because we weren't thinking about that from the start. And if you weren't thinking about it from the start, you can't really evaluate it. I used to have a developer, uh, when I joined his team, the team lead took me aside and was like, he's going to refactor something, tell him no. <laughs> um, and that was really fun because he wanted to make a better product, but we had to kind of rein that in so that we could make sure the features that we were contractually delivering were as good as possible. I love that kid. Environmental issues. Changing anything on production, on staging, on dev is going to increase the risk. A lot of times you don't think about staging as being a risky place, but if it doesn't mirror production in exactly, and it doesn't, it can potentially be useless. Um, I saw some tweets coming through about a talk where someone kept saying over and over, staging is useless, and I need to hunt it down, because that sounds really interesting, and it also makes the hairs on the back of my neck rise up, which is the sign of a good talk. Uh, new or inexperienced team members can also be risky. Hi, that's me. I'm your new team member. I've only been at my job for a month and a half. I know nothing. <laughs> I don't even know what I don't know. And that's really kind of a cool place to be because I get to learn everything. But at the same time, I also have to learn everything. <laughs> Uh, I've started taking to switching where I'm sitting so I can sit next to all the QA people. It's getting super annoying, but I love it. Um, natural disasters. I'm from North Carolina. We have hurricanes. We have terrible drainage. <laughs> There's been more than one time where I've been flooded in or out of the office with and without power. Uh, if the power goes out in the office for my old job, Every staging server went down, every team environment went down, and parts of production stopped working. Don't think about that too much. It hurts. Uh, sickness. Had an entire scrub team out for three weeks because someone didn't get their flu shot. Get your flu shots. And that's something you can't actually predict very well. You never quite know when sickness like that is going to hit, and sometimes it does. 
Outside pressure, your CEO walks past like, that thing, do that thing. Or a VP, or literally anybody that thinks they have a say in your life walks past and tells you to do a thing. And then industry-specific risks. My old position was in digital marketing. Facebook was generally considered a risk for us because they would randomly update their API. They'd be like, okay, so that thing you used to do? Nah, it's cool. You don't need to do that thing. Yes, we do. We do need to do that thing. Uh, so that was, that was a really interesting experience. They also didn't have a good sandbox. <laughs> I know, baby, it's a lot to think about. Yes, it's necessary. Shout out to Bojangles. Oh, you guys don't have Bojangles here. E I am so sorry for literally everyone else in this room. Come down to North Carolina, I will buy you a biscuit. <laughs> don't tweet that. I don't need the entire Twitterverse asking me for biscuits. <laughs> Yes, it is absolutely necessary to talk about risk. It's absolutely necessary to talk about this language. We cannot test everything. We have limited time, limited bodies, limited resources, limited attention spans. I get bored super easily. If you ask me to test everything, I'm not going to. And if I do, I'm going to do it really terribly. Once humans get bored, we make mistakes. We make all the mistakes, and we don't realize we're making them. And that's the main reason why testing everything is, is kind of depressing, <laughs> because you know you're going to fail at it. And that's, that's a bummer. So we assess risk. We talk about the impact of failure. We talk about the probability of that failure. We define these terms so that we can create this language, so that we can start saying, OK, we can't test everything, but we can test what's risky. We can test what's important. We can test what makes a difference in our lives. Well, I needed that slide like three minutes ago. <laughs> what we can do is we can communicate clearly and precisely why we test what we test. I can say I'm doing this because it's risky and it's not just wavy arm man freaking out about risk. It's me having sat down with my team during grooming and said, is this risky? Has this failed before? What happened when it failed? What could happen if it fails? Why are you not as scared about this as I am? What do you know that I don't know? You get so much information by asking that. Uh, and then the developer made fun of me for saying I was scared. It's like, it's just code. And I'm like, a little scary little letters. Um, I miss that guy. <laughs> and when I say test, in my world, I mean test. I mean, I do a thing, I make a thing, I test a thing, I get the information back, I relay it. However, this can also be giving more attention to one item than another item. It could be raising concerns about a feature, talking about needing more resources, choosing what stories to play even, and asking for more time, and then where do you focus your manual and automated efforts? Risk can be used to evaluate all of these things. You can use it to say, hey, I have a concern about this. I think it's risky. Let me define these terms for you. Let me talk to you about them. And then let's have this conversation between the two of us, between the four of us, between the eight of us as to what risk is and what we can do to mitigate it. Oh, Dante thinks we should have a serious discussion. About oh, no, Dante just wants to take naps. Spoiler alert, I picked that flooring color because it matched my cat. <laughs> Normally, I dive into some risk matrix examples here. I'm not going to do that because, as I guessed, <laughs> I'm probably out of time. But it exists. It'll be in my slides, and we can talk about it at some point if you'd like to find me. Uh, I'm super cool. I promise. Uh, so, but the one thing I want to leave you with on risk matrices a complex or simple, they need to convey the correct information. When we start making these, we're talking about actually putting a number on the impact of the failure, the probability of the failure, and using that to determine where we go, how we move forward. I do want to tell you a story, because I love stories. This one's true. Imagine this. 
my team is in a room together. We are not happy creatures. We are sitting around a table. Our product owner is sitting across the table from me. And my team lead says, we can't release this project. And my product owner goes, why can't we release this product? It was in alpha for like a year. And we've had it in beta for like three months. You guys have had so much time. Why can't we release this product? And we all kind of looked around and I said, this product was a good girl who went to college, fell in with the wrong crowd, started drinking, needs to go to rehab before we can release her to the public. <laughs> and he looked down and he looked up and he's like, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> what I meant was, <laughs> We got deep into this project. We found that there was a significant amount of bugs, a significant amount of refactoring, and some re-architecting that had to happen for it to even freaking run on our production servers. And that was insane. It was so much more work than we thought it was going to be. And then we demoed it for the users, and they told us they wouldn't use it. And we're like, um, can you guys approve the designs? You, you approve the design? And they're like, we haven't seen this. I'm like, it's been almost a year and no one's talked to you? Panic attacks. I was having them. Other people were having them. It was one of those situations where the VP of engineering walked into the room and it's like, so, we're doing this, right? We're like, we're not doing this. We can't, we can't do this. What we did was we started creating a risk matrix. We sat back and we said, okay, what are the things that have gone wrong? What are the bugs? What's the impact of those bugs? What does it look like if we let them out? We decided on these different terms. We wanted to say, what's the risk to the user of catastrophic failure? What's the risk to engineering of significant technical debt? What's the risk to the team's morale of failing sprints, having hot fixes, anything that would drag us down? And then we also said, when can we fix these issues? Is it something that has to be fixed before we hit prod? Is it something we can take care of afterwards if given the time? And I also argued for a pitchfork index, which is how upset I thought the users were going to be if we didn't fix some bugs. Um, it's very important to me that people in my groups and my, on my teams understand that they are not just making things because they were told to make a thing. They're making a thing because a person needs it. And if nobody needs your product, why are you making it? So no one agreed with my pitchfork index, but I kept bringing it up, and they started laughing at me, which is fine. I'm cool with that, clearly. <laughs> so we were able to actually get out in front of our VP of engineering and say, hey, this is why we can't release. This is why this can no longer be a Q2 goal for us. We have reasons. We have words, we have meanings, we have definition. We built trust with him and said, hey, this is what we've got. We're not going to put it under the rug. We're not going to lie to you. We're going to give you actual numbers that tell you how bad we feel. And he was like, hmm, Q4 then. And that was a huge win for us because we actually got the time to talk to the users, make the design that they would use, and fix a lot of the bugs, and then I quit my job. Supposedly it went well, though. <laughs> uh, and, of course, Dante always discussed risk with everyone involved. No birds were harmed in the making of the presentation. Here is your possum. I apologize. The previous slide usually has a picture of Dante and possums. They're super cute. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to do this super quick. If we talk about risk, the more we do it, the more cohesive our team is going to be. One of the fundamental things of building a team, of building a tribe, of building a group of people, is to give them a language that is their own. To give them something that when they say it to each other, they're like, ah, I know what that means. A little in-joke, a little out-joke, a little slightly inappropriate joke some way to describe something that you do as a team that is unique to that team. The language of risk can be that for your team. It's great to have other funnier things that aren't quite as serious, 
Uh, one of my other teams, we look at each other and we're like, you're eating ants. <laughs> and people are like, what? It's a term that we came up with to describe somebody doing something silly because they're being unattended. <laughs> like when you're at a family reunion and there's that one three-year-old in the corner that no one's paying attention to and they're eating ants because of course they are. So we would say things like that and that was our team's internal language. Don't tell them I told you about ants. But we could look at each other and be like, huh, ants. Everyone would laugh. No one else would laugh. We were a team. Risk does the same thing. We become better. We become more cohesive. We start making better things, cooler things. The best. We can use it for more thoughtful testing and more thoughtful conversation. We build trust by building language. I know, baby. He gets overwhelmed by thinking about risk. To be fair, he gets overwhelmed all the time. Oh, there it goes. That's my presentation, my darlings. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something about communication, something about risk. Uh, I have put a few conversation starters up here because we are getting ready to go to the party. It's going to be super fun. I'm super excited. Think about some of these things. Ask some random person in the audience one of these questions, or ask me, or ask somebody in a blue shirt. Start to talk about language, start to think about language, start to think about emotions, and start to think about how adorable my freaking cat is.